write down uh, yes, this regime this way, so h is a small parameter. And if you look at the wave equation, I'm not looking at the wave equation, but the half wave equation in some sense, which just factorize the wave equation, end up with, uh, end up with this uh, half wave equation. And <coughs> this wave equation can be solved by, in terms of the propagator, okay, which is this, this, this operator, okay, which is a unitary in L2, L2 of the domain. And so, <coughs> uh, what we know is that in the high frequency regime, one can connect the quantum evolution of the wave ev evolution, that is the evolution of this, this equation, can be connected with the, the ray dynamics, okay, the geodesic, geodesic, broken geodesic flow, or the ray dynamics, on the cotangent, uh, or tangent, okay, uh, there's a, it's a duality between tangent and cotangent, <coughs> cotangent bundle of the, of the manifold. And of course, due to the homogeneity of these this ray dynamics, we can respect to the unique cotangent bundle, this is what we will do most of the time. So I will focus on, uh, well, I would like to focus on, on domains for which there is no separation of variables, in particular domains for which we have uh, so, some form of strong chaos. And uh, very, very soon I will uh, restrict myself to very chaotic systems which are uh, not anymore flat drums, okay, but which are uh, uh, closed, closed uh, Riemannian manifolds of negative coverage. So in this case, you replace the flat Laplacian by the Laplace Beltrami operator, and you still can analyze the wave dynamics or half wave dynamics in terms of the, the, the propagator. Propagator now depends on the, on the Laplace Beltrami operator. And the ray dynamics in this setup, the ray dynamics is given by the geodesic flow on the, uh, on the cotangent, uh, unit cotangent bundle. <coughs> the is the unit cotangent bundle. So, okay, we've seen already uh, yesterday, okay, examples of uh, Anosov and those of surfaces, <coughs> so we know what, uh, what uh, unstable direction is. So this is a, okay, let's say reference, reference uh, geodesic in the unit cotangent bundle. <coughs> and close to this, if we look at, at geodesics close to this reference geodesic, some of them are attracted in the, f in the future, are attracted to, the, to, the, uh, <coughs> to this uh, exponentially converge to this reference geodesic in the future, and uh, others, others uh, exponentially converge in the, in the past direction. And these are respectively uh, in the in the stable uh, are displacements in the stable direction, respectively in the unstable direction. All right. <coughs> so I mean, this separation, this foliation, so these stable and unstable uh, manifolds, uh, they foliate uh, they foliate the unit. Sorry, they foliate the unit uh, unit cotangent bundle, and thanks to this foliation, uh, Hopf and Anosov proved that the flow is ergodic and. and okay. So. <coughs> This, but my study will be, will be uh, micro-local, so I will focus on what happens in, uh, in, uh, in the cotangent bund bundle rather than on the base, uh, base manifold. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> for the first result on this question of, uh, of uh, distribution of eigenmodes is the result by, by uh, uh, Perelman, uh, Zedic, and Colin Gardier, which dates back from, from uh, 50 years ago. So, <coughs> just from the assumption of an ergodic flow, and the fact that the geodesic flow is ergodic, we don't need mixing, or we don't need any stronger form of chaos, uh, Schneerman proved that, <coughs> that almost all eigenstates, in the sense of uh, a subsequence of uh, density one of all the eigenstates, that these modes, they become flatter and flatter in, at, the microscopic, at the microscopic scale, which means that if you fix, uh, if you fix uh, an open set, uh, V here, Okay, on the on the base manifold. So this is the expression on the base manifold. If you fix this open set and you uh, weight it by a uh, square, then this converges. This converges to the. Uh, this converges to this. Uh, <coughs> this converges to one in the weak sense. Okay, so that is this integral converges to the volume of this uh, of this open set, which means that at the macroscopic scale, the eigen modes in this subsequence the eigenmodes, they become uh, flatter and flatter. Okay? And one can lift this, uh, this uh, equidistribution, this asymptotic equidistribution can be lifted to phase space, and to do this, we have to use, uh, uh, let's say, families of test functions in phase space, which transform into a family of test operators. Okay? Test operators, they are quantizations of semi-classical quantization, that is quantization with a parameter h, corresponding to the typical wavelength we want to investigate. So we want this operator is a test operator which tests the, 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 the density of the eigenfunctions <coughs> both in, the, in position in X and also in Fourier space, that in, in the momentum of Fourier space at the scale H, okay, at, the, at the oscillation scale H. So we have to adapt the operator to the scale of oscillation, and this is why these operators depend on the scale, uh, on this small parameter H. 
And so if you want to test the eigenmode uj, the eigenmode uj oscillates on scale on wavelength h index j, okay, h j, and so we have to adapt the test operator. This is why the test operator here depends on this, on this scale. And <coughs> the lift of this equidistribution is, uh, is an equidistribution statement, which is both in position and momentum. Okay, that is, that if you test this by this phase space, uh, phase space uh, function a, a of x and xi, so xi is the momentum, is the momentum uh, coordinates at the scale h, then you end up, it, it converges weakly to the Liouville measure, which is the, the lift of the Lebesgue measure on phase space, on s star. Okay, so this is the equidistribution statement, but this equidistribution statement uh, <coughs> holds inside the subsequent. Okay. Subsequent, which means uh, almost all uh, eigenmodes, but maybe not not all eigenmodes. And so soon after this, uh, soon after this, this statement was uh, finally proven in the 80s, <coughs> uh, people wondered whether one can lift, one can remove this this condition of extracting a subsequence. Okay. So this conjecture, this quantum unique agonistic conjecture, states that uh, well, assumes that we don't need to extract the subsequence, okay. that all eigenmodes will have this behavior. Okay. But if you go back to my, the picture I had at the beginning, you know, we had this eigenmode which had this, this strong, strong uh, concentration on the, on the uh, periodic, periodic, uh, periodic, uh, ray, periodic orbit, periodic ray. And the question from that time has been, does this, uh, does this uh, strong concentration on the ray, does it, is it visible, does it persist in the high frequency limit? Okay, the, do they, are there sequences of eigenstates which have a, a specific concentration in this sense, that is in the L2 sense, L2 mass sense, along this, uh, this ray, for instance? Okay, so this, this conjecture somehow answers by no. That uh, if you really look at this in this L2, L, L2 setup, in this L2 uh, <coughs> estimation of the mass, then everything should become flat. So this conjecture is still uh, let's say open <coughs> okay, in, this, uh, in this setup. And uh, <coughs> instead of, uh, well, people have tried to, to, to improve on it, and what had the improvements, the mathematical improvements, have been to try to restrict the possible concentration phenomena. I mean, if, if some eigenmodes, some exceptional eigenmodes would concentrate, then uh, they would concentrate, they cannot concentrate too much. Okay, that, that's the type of result which, uh, which have been proved. <coughs> So, I mean, to, state, to, to, to study how much, what does it mean that it concentrates much? First thing is that by using by just a, a, weak, weak star, a weak star compactness argument, from any sequence of eigenmodes, any high-frequency sequence of eigenmodes, one can always extract subsequences, okay, by just weak compactness, extract subsequences, okay, called like E, uh, capital, uh, <coughs> calligraphic E, uh, such that the eigenmodes along this sequ se sequence, along this subsequence, the eigenmodes have the same behavior, have the same concentration behavior, and here this such a concentration behavior is embodied uh, in, a, in a measure, in an invariant, in a, in a probability measure, which is called a semiclassical measure. Okay, so semiclassical measure is just one one type of concentration along all um, among all the possible types of concentrations you have in the full uh, in the full sequence, in the full sequence of eigenstates. Okay, so the assumption, if there is no no, if there, is, if there are counterexamples to, to QE. Counterexample means that there exists a subsequence such that this limit here, this uh, this uh, here, would concentrate to would be described by a measure which is which would be different from the Liouville measure. But at least we know that they would be described by some measure, and this measure here is a probability measure, and it is invariant through the flow. Okay, so we uh, end up with uh, asking ourselves already what type of invariant measures do we have classically for, for this geodesic flow. And for these, these flows, for the flows of negative curvature, the flow is anosov. So we know that there are many measures. In particular, there are measures uh, associated with each uh, closed geodesic, okay, closed, uh, closed orbit. <coughs> and uh, that these orbits, there are infinitely many of them. And from these orbits, we can also take limits of compositions of uh, such measures and ending up with uh, uh, lots of <coughs> measures which have, a, for instance, full support, or some of them have a, have a, a fractal support. I mean, there are all types of zoo, there's a whole zoo of, uh, of invariant measures in this, uh, in this setup of, of another flow, for such an another flow, okay. And so the uh, question is, among all these invariant measures, they are all candidates, they all candidates as limits of eigenmodes, because uh, one can say, why would quantum mechanics restrict, uh, restrict the, the set of, of uh, possible behaviors, uh, long-term behaviors? And there has been some, some results in the sense that not all these measures are allowed. And so the first rigorous result on this was the work of Anand Arman in the year 2006 or something. <coughs> yes, then she proved that 
uh, well, one can see two, two types of results, that the support of the limit measure, of this classical measure, cannot be arbitrarily small, arbitrarily thin, okay? The dimension of this support, so this is in, in case of constant negative curvature. The support is here has dimension <coughs> greater or equal to two, so, so two is larger than one. One is just a, along one orbit, would be a delta measure on the periodic orbit, would have dimension one. And uh, the full uh, phase space here is, uh, is the unit cotangent bundle, which has dimension three. So somehow two is just in the middle between one and three. So that's <coughs> one result. So it means that mm -hmm. such limit measures have a certain thickness in terms of uh, dimension, house dot dimension. And she also proved the result on the, on the Komnogorov Sinai entropy. <coughs> okay, that is the Komnogorov Sinai entropy, the measure entropy of this, the, of this, uh, this semi classical measure is bounded from below. Of course, these two results are related to one another. But still, this, this bound here, okay, it's, it does not tell us that the support of the measure is the full, uh, is the full cotangent bundle. There could be limit ma limiting measures which have, uh, which have a fractal support, okay, which, have, which would be a, a proper fractal uh, invariant subset of the, of the phase space. Okay, <coughs> so that's the result. And uh, the recent, more recent result was, uh, was the one uh, proved by Dietloff and Jean in case of negative co constant negative curvature. Okay, and only in two dimensions. So this is uh, <coughs> only for height for surfaces, whereas the, the work by Alan Tarnan was, uh, was uh, negative curvature in any dimension. So the statement is that <coughs> semi-classical measures have a full support, must have full support. Yeah. That is for any uh, open non-empty open set, uh, calligraphic V, <coughs> there exists some constant, some fixed constant, such that for any semi-classical measure, if you can extract any semi-classical measure, which is, uh, which is uh, of course, non-trivial, it's a probability measure, then it has a weight, it must, it must weight, it must put some, some mass, which, and the mass is bounded below, independently of the, of the subsequence you extract. Okay. So <coughs> that's in phase space, and when you project this phase space result on the phase manifold, it tells you, it gives you that, if you just look at the, the, the eigenmodes themselves on the base manifold, on the base surface, then the weight, the L2 mass of the of, the, of this eigenmode on, on the any open set, on the non-trivial open set, is bounded from below you, independently of the frequency. Okay, that's the, the main result. Okay, the main uh, non-trivial thing is that this, uh, this bound here is independent of the frequency. So on any surface, there is a bound, there is a, a lower bound for the mass of the eigenmode on, uh, on some uh, open sets, but the bound uh, usually depends, depends in this way of the, of the on the frequency, so this is due from this is proof from from Carleman estimates, <coughs> or from from quantitative unique continu continuation estimates. Okay, but here the the, the statement, the non-trivial statement, is that the bound is independent of the frequency. So we cannot have, we cannot concentrate the eigenmodes cannot concentrate on a subset which is not which is a, uh, <coughs> on a subset which is uh, which is not the full uh, the full uh, the full sub the full manifold. Okay, it has to to delocalize, so this is why you can see it as a full delocalization. So it's, it's less precise than uh, equidistribution. Okay, that's not any like, <coughs> state equidistribution mm -hmm. in terms of converge to the to the to the UV, UV measure, but if it, it converges to measure which have which have full support. Okay, so that's that's the statement. Okay, so this was proved by Dieter and and my contribution was to uh, <coughs> to generalize this with them, was to generalize this to to variable curvature. So a bit different. Okay, the tools you can use are a bit different. But nevertheless, the proof uh, I will give uh, is mostly. I mean, uh, <coughs> the, the beginning of the proof is the same. Okay, so uh, somewhat uh, the differences are in the technical, uh, some technical uh, details which are a bit heavy to write down. But let's say the idea, the main idea is the same. Okay. I try. At the end, I will give some some hints of the differences between the two setups. Okay, so that's <coughs> that's uh, the result I want to talk about. Full deification, and so far it's only for, for surfaces. Okay, so in two dimension. <coughs> okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's say uh, let's start to give an idea. <coughs> okay, so the idea somewhat the, the, uh, the, this proof uh, already gets inspiration from from the work of Anand Taraman. So it, it somewhat trans, transports to, to wave mechanics or to quantum mechanics, transports uh, uh, ideas and methods from, from, uh, from uh, classical, uh, classical chaos, classical uh, chaotic systems, in particular, uh, the idea that you should try to write down symbolic dynamics, form of symbolic dynamics, okay. 
to transform this uh, this uh, this flow or this uh, <coughs> let's say a propagator, uh, transform it and cut it into many pieces, and each piece is in a sense simple. Okay. So, <coughs> but what we want to show? Okay, let's go back to what we want to show. We want to show that, okay, here uh, I'm using micro analysis. I'm using two differential operators, which means that uh, I don't like very much. Uh, <coughs> Uh, characteristic functions. Okay, so, so if I want to test the mass of uh, a mass of a wave function, so U H now will be a wave function. Okay, U U J, I will write it U H and H is this parameter is this wavelength. Okay, wavelength of my eigenmode. Yeah. So <coughs> uh, what we want to show is that we want to replace the characteristic function in some open set by a smooth characteristic function. So A one is we have to view it as a, a smooth. Uh, a regularized characteristic function in some part of, in some open set in, the, in phase space. So I will, I, will, uh, I will work in phase space, I will not work on the base manifold. So, I want so this, this has to be understood as a, a smooth characteristic function on this open set in phase space. And what we want to show, we want to show that, uh, in some sense, the weight of my eigenmode mode in this region, so which is in somehow represented by Applying this, this cutoff operator, this operator of H of A1 has to be understood as a sort of cutoff operator in this region, uh, in this open set V. Okay. So once I cut off my eigenfunction on this, uh, on this uh, open set V, what remains? And what I want to show is that what remains in terms of mass, of L2 mass, is bounded from below. Uh, UH here, I normalize this. Okay. So this is equal to 1. Okay. This, I want to normalize my eigenmode in L2. So I want to show that this is bounded by, from below by a constant which is independent of, of H. So C A one is constant independent. So C one is in sense uh, one over uh, one over C little v, which I had uh, before. Okay. So this is the type of estimate we want to show. And in PDE, this is uh, this this type of estimate is interpreted sometimes as a control control estimate, which means that I can I want to control my full eigen mode from in terms of one part of it. Okay. This is just one part of my eigen mode. This is the part which is micro localized in this uh, in this uh, region. And I, I claim that this region controls the whole thing. This is the type of estimate we want to show. And so, as I say, the strategy is to, to cut, <coughs> let's say, to cut phase space into pieces. Okay. So we're, we already have one operator or one, one function here in phase space, or one operator which cuts one part, which only localizes on one part of phase space. And let's just look at the complement, that is, we just. Uh, write down this, uh, this A1 and complement it by A2 such that near, at least near the unit cotangent bundle, we have the sum is equal to 1. So everything will happen because my, I will always apply my operators to the eigenstate UH. UH is the eigenmode, and because it's the eigenmode of uh, H squared Laplacian is equal to 1, minus, <coughs> then it is microlocalized. This eigenstate is microlocalized around the, around the unit cotangent bundle. So everything happens microlocally around the uh, cotangent, unique cotangent bundle. So what, what, is, what happens far away is, is irrelevant. Okay. So I just need to control to, to understand this, these, these functions and the quantizations of these functions, these operators. Uh, I need to understand them near the cotangent, unique cotangent bundle. So this is why I'm, I'm using some terminology. You don't need to, to know uh, exactly what it means. <coughs> but uh, okay. this, this identity here, uh, equivalent to identity near S star M. What does it mean? It means that if you inject, if you apply these operators here to an object, an, an ag, uh, for instance, this eigen mode, or some mode which is microlocalized near the unique cotangent bundle, then, then it is the action on this state is uh, similar to the, uh, to the identity. From a classical, at the classical level, that is uh, on. on we start from a, a <coughs> partition of unity into two pieces. Okay, one piece is on this uh, set V, on this open set V, which is fixed from now on, and the remaining piece, uh, which is uh, localized on the complement of V, in some sense. <coughs> and then the idea is to transfer to, to bring this uh, this partition of unity into the quantum uh, wave uh, wave uh, world, in some sense. Okay, that is, we, we take this function in phase space, we quantize them with this adapted adapted parameter H, okay, with this chosen parameter H. We end up with two operators, and these two operators, <coughs> the quantization of this equality here ends up with this, this equality. That is, when you apply these two operators to this eigenstate, you end up essentially with identity applied to the eigenstate plus some junk, okay, some very small junk. Okay. And small junk is, uh, any, uh, is, uh, is small in the, in the limit, in the semi-classical limit, when this parameter h uh, goes to zero. Okay. So this is the first 
quantum partition of unity. So we have partitioned our uh, eigenmode into two pieces. One piece which is inside, inside, inside this, which is microlocalized inside, inside this V, and one piece which is microlocalized outside, which remains. And this, this is here, this part here is the one, this is the A1 here. This is the control part, okay? But we want to control uh, the full state with. Okay. And now, of course, uh, we have to use, if we want to make use of the dynamics, of the classical dynamics on the properties of the dynamics, the idea is to evolve. That is, even though this, this eigen mode is, a, this eigen mode is a stationary, it does not evolve in a sense, but now each piece here, we, we, once we cut it into two pieces, each piece will evolve. Okay. And when I say evolve, I mean apply the, apply the propagator. Okay. Apply the quantum propagator. All right. And so we can either apply the propagator to the state, or we can apply the propagator to the, by, by the adjoint action, we can apply the propagator to the, the operators. Okay. So we'll do that. We'll apply the evolution to the propagator. <coughs> And because the, 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 the propagation is unitary, okay, this, this uh, quantum partition of unity translates, I mean, it translates to partitions of unity for any time. After any time of propagation, we still have this, uh, this uh, equivalent here. Okay, so we have a whole family in this time, whole family of, uh, of, uh, of partitions of unity, quantum partition of unity. Okay. And what, what can we do with that? Then we can start to use, uh, to use tools from, from uh, uh, semi-classical analysis or microlocal analysis, <coughs> and the main tool, one of the main tools, will be this so-called co correspondence principle between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, which is a semi-classical correspondence, which tells you that when you, you evolve quantum mechanically your operator, the quantum evolution is approximately equal, well, equivalent with the classical evolution. Okay? That is, classical evolution means that I, I, I evolve my classical uh, symbol or function, phase space function by the flow, and then I quantize it. And here I do the opposite. I first quantize it into this operator AI, and then I, I evolve it by my propagator. So this, this, this is called Yegorov theorem. Okay. And there's a junk, there's a, a remainder here, and this remainder is small in stand when, when h goes to zero, but this remainder is not uniform with respect to the time. Okay. So somehow this remainder starts to grow, to grow with time, and uh, in some sense this, this equality makes sense as long as this uh, classical function, uh, this evolved function is not oscillatory, does not start to oscillate too much. So one has to control, in a sense, uh, how this, this guy oscillates. So if you fix the time and you let semi classical parameter go to zero, of course, if you fix the time, then uh, this is what it is. I mean, the, the oscillation will be fixed. But we will be interested in times which grow together with sending h to zero. So we have two limits which do not commute with one another. One limit is h go to zero, a semi-classical limit. And the other limit is uh, time goes to infinity, because we're interested in long time, we'll be interested in long time behavior. And these two limits, they, they do not match, or, I mean, they cannot commute. And so, <coughs> in a, in, so one is always trying to, trying to adapt uh, one limit to the other, right? So if we let the time grow, and, and at the same time let h go to zero, there's a step of barrier where this, this, uh, this Yegorov theorem breaks down, is when the oscillations of the, the function, the symbol, becomes too strong, and, <coughs> and somewhat the, the, the lim limit point when things go, uh, go really badly is when the, the, the oscillation is at the scale square root h. Why is it square root h? Square root h, when you look at square root h dis distances in phase space, you end up, this, this, this comes close to the uncertainty principle. Uncertainty principle tells you that you cannot squeeze a quantum state in a box smaller than square root h. In, uh, in, uh, in phase space, right? square root h in position and in momentum, right? And so it gives you it, it gives you an idea of why why this this type of uh, classical quantum correspondence will have problems or will break down or at least will have problems <coughs> when you go beyond this uh, this uh, minimal uncertainty uh, scale. Okay. So already when this tells you that we have to be careful when trying to send the time to infinity together with sending the wavelength to to zero. Sending h to h to zero. <coughs> okay, so we have well, so for, for the moment we have a, a whole family of uh, partitions of unity, and <coughs> the idea, which was already used by uh, by Darman, is now to compose that is to put together all these partitions of unity to compose this uh, evolved partition. When I say compose, I mean I have operators. They are all bounded operators. So I can compose them, okay, and <coughs> compose them and compose uh, discretely by by taking discrete times, okay. And uh, then uh, look at this uh, discrete set of partitions of unity and, and compose them. 
And when you do that, when you compose all these, these equalities from time starting from 0, 1, 2, up to n, or n minus 1, then <coughs> you end up with, you can represent these compositions in terms of a global sum, and uh, you get operators when you expand all, all these, uh, these, uh, all these uh, partitions of unity, when you compose them, when you expand them all, you end up with operators, a sum of operators of this type, okay, when you have an operator evolved at time 0, at time 1, at time 2, and at time uh, n minus 1. And so uh, <coughs> this this can be called, this can be labeled by a word, okay, by a word, and each each uh, element, each uh, letter of this word is just equal to one or two. Okay, so it's, a, it's an alphabet on two symbols, which is the easiest possible alphabet to imagine. So <coughs> you have such operators; we can call them word operators. So you have a sum of words. You have two to the n words of uh, size n, okay, and each word is just a sequence of ones and twos. Okay. <coughs> So as long as the time is not too large, that is, as long as uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, symbols, these symbols or these operators are admissible, we can use then semi-classical, uh, uh, this, this quantum correspondence, quantum classical correspondence, okay, this Igorov theorem, as well as the semi-classical calculus. So semi-classical calculus here is just the fact that when you, when you compose two operators which are quantization of some functions, you end up with an operator which is approximately the composition of the product. So it's like... The, Say that the classical algebra, simple multiplication algebra of a function of phase space, uh, is uh, approximately corresponds to composition of operators. This is, of course, there are some, some. This is not an equality. This is a. Okay, so there are some. There are some smaller, smaller remainder. Okay, but that's that's the what I call semi-classical calculus. Okay, you can replace product of operators by product of functions, which is usually to be easier. So the, what is the function like? But the function is just the product of the evolution of a1 or a2. Okay. Again, a index w0 is just function a1 or function a2 and evolve at time 1, at time 2, at time n minus. Okay. And so you see that these operators, I remind you that a1, a2 are approximately uh, characteristic functions on an open set, some open set in phase space. <coughs> so in the product of characteristic function, an evolved characteristic function Characteristic function is still a characteristic function, so in a sense, this is like a, a product of characteristic functions. So it resembles very much uh, what is called symbolic dynamics in classical dynamics, except that these functions are not exactly characteristic functions, but they are smooth. Okay. You can forget that. The description of sum, I mean, so we are, we are just uh, cutting, cutting the function 1 as into a sum of, uh, of uh, many partitions, product of, of uh, partitions at different times. So it's like a refinement of the original partition into two, two terms, into two pieces. Okay? It's refined by the classical flow. <coughs> so this can be called a, sorry, smooth symbolic dynamics. And uh, this, is, this, this can be called a, a quantum symbolic dynamics, <coughs> using the fact that we, we refine this, uh, these partitions by using the, the, the dynamics. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> uh, all right. <coughs> so here I start to make some pictures. And uh, I start to investigate, but what? Sorry, is there, isn't there something? No. Okay. <coughs> what? Uh, what? How, how far can we go in time? I mean, uh, how, how far can we can we evolve in times with respect to the to the semi-classical parameter? So, for what times are these symbols are these evolved symbols here indeed admissible in the sense that they don't oscillate too much? So, if you go at this uh, here, I just I would just look at what happens transversely to the to the flow. So, you have to imagine that the flow is coming from the blackboard. So, the geodesic is like here. Okay, it issues from the blackboard, and I'm drawing here the unstable local unstable manifold and local stable manifold here. So, we start at time zero. It is time zero, and then <coughs> the evolution is just the composition of a j with the with the flow. So, if you go to some later time, you see that this function here evolves by this flow has been uh, elongated along, it's a bit uh, un counterintuitive, but it, it is elongated along the stable manifold, okay, not along the unstable, but along the stable manifold. It's like the <coughs> the, the and it is squeezed along the, stable, uh, the unstable direction. It is squeezed by, exponentially squeezed with, squeezed with time and lambda is uh, the, the local Lyapunov exponent. So lambda is positive, the positive Lyapunov exponent, and in the in the stable direction it has been elongated also at the at the on the with an exponential rate which is uh, given by this e to the lambda e to the lambda t. And if you go beyond, if you go to larger and larger times, 
this uh, sort of cigar, we get along more and very elongated, more and more elongated along the stable manifold. And the stable manifold, it, uh, because the, the space space is compact, the stable manifold uh, winds, winds around the, around the, the phase space. Okay? Winds around the, the manifold, or a star of the manifold. And so it gets thinner and thinner, it gets into strips which are thinner and thinner, and it starts to wind around, that is, uh, wind around the manifold. <coughs> so here, at some later time, it's given by three stripes locally. And if you go to later time, it would be uh, 10 stripes, uh, million stripes <coughs> or 1 million stripes if you want. They get thinner and thinner and longer and longer. Okay? And, and they start to become, uh, uh, say, to, 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 to become dense, to become dense on the, on the okay. So, if you see that, if you're interested in this, the, 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 the rate of oscillation, how, how, how strongly does the function oscillate, what is interesting is that is this, this thinness, okay? how, how thin is this, uh, this stripe? The stripe, the thinnest, is e to the minus lambda t, t the time, and lambda is this uh, Lyapunov exponent. Okay. Know that. <coughs> okay. So in constant curvature, lambda is the same everywhere, equal to 1, for instance. First curvature is, is equal to minus 1. <coughs> and uh, so you see that during, I mean, so, so what I'm showing is the, is the support of this function. So this function here oscillates between 0 and 1. Okay. So you can imagine that here at the middle of each stripe, it is equal to 1. So it means that the, the derivative, the, if you look at the derivative transverse, transversely to the strike, the derivative will grow like e to the lambda t. Okay. And so this is why uh, somewhat, <coughs> it, it, so the derivatives grow exponentially fast with the time. And so when you reach this time, that is one half of uh, log h over lambda, uh, you'll have derivatives which are of size h to the minus one half, which means that you have oscillations, the function will oscillate between zero and one on scales uh, square, root, uh, square root h. So this is like a breakup break time, one half of, the, of TE, when TE is, uh, is called uh, the NFS time. So it's a logarithmic time. So in this type of setup, the interesting time scales will be logarithmic, but you don't, don't just need to say logarithmic, you also need to, to look at the constant in front of the logarithm. Okay. It's the constant in front of 1 over lambda times logarithm, where lambda is some typically a of exponent. Okay. <coughs> so this is the relevant time scale for what we're doing. <coughs> okay. So let's go back to our goal. So what we want is to, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, to control this full, full state, full eigenstate, to control it by just one piece, okay, by this piece here. And <coughs> now, this, my, I'm using the partition, the refined quantum partition of unity. That is, this guy is essentially of, of, up, to, up to remainders of size of h to h to infinity, up to negligible remainder. This is the sum over uh, all these pieces. Okay. <coughs> So now the question is, among all these pieces, uh, among all these word operators, uh, are some of them better than the others? Okay, and they are indeed, uh, let's say, good words. Okay? There are some family of good words which can be controlled, naturally controlled in some sense by this, by this control here. Okay? So I'm not, uh, I'm not going to spend much time there. <coughs> let's say that by using semi-classical uh, method, by using Igorov theorem, which is this uh, quantum classical correspondence, and using also uh, semi-classical, other semi-classical tools, <coughs> one can end up with, uh, uh, let's say, one can, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, <coughs> put in evidence some, some family of good symbols, and here, one example of these good symbols, the family of good symbols, or good, uh, not sim good symbols, sorry, good words, are the words which contain many ones, or at least sufficiently many symbols one. So I remind you that the word is a sequence of ones and two. Okay? And if you got the classical interpretation, if you look at the classical corresponding symbol here, what does it mean to be in, in the support of this, uh, in this AW, to be a good word, means that when you look at the trajectory of the point which is inside the support of this good word, then <coughs> uh, when you look at the trajectory, this trajectory will spend a non-negligible time, will, will travel uh, and spend non-negligible time inside the control region. Okay, the control region in means that uh, means that along the trajectory I, I will be a finite I will be in a, a, at least a fixed frequency a fixed frequency of the times I will be inside this, this control region. So I mean this <coughs> let's say this is a classical let's say property and this translates into the fact that if I look at, at these words this uh, this alpha good words so alpha is just a fixed number between zero and one. Then if I look at these alpha good words, words which have sufficiently many ones, okay, in the, then uh, this can be controlled in this way. So I'm not going into the details. It just, well, it uses some, some tricks, but it's not, uh, it's not so difficult in some sense. Okay. So <coughs> there are 
sum over this alpha good good is controlled, okay, there you have, there's a loss in the terms of, if you, if you take alpha small, that is, you don't ask too much, okay, if alpha is not too, if alpha is one over 100, for instance, then you lose in a constant here, but this is still a constant which is independent of frequency, independent of h, okay, so this is what you want. But uh, let's say that we don't, re we don't mind so much about, about alpha being small, because it's, it's small, but it's independent of h. So these, these words okay, can be <coughs> controlled by semi-classical techniques by using these propagation properties, the Igor property. So first we do it for small times, that is before this threshold time, which was t of 4, for which we can use uh, all the techniques uh, of uh, quantum correspondence. And then there's also a trick which allows you to go from this, uh, let's say, short logarithmic times to longer logarithmic times. And we, so we can uh, actually generalize this to times of order twice the Rn first time, which is which we don't have direct access to these operators. These operators are not anymore accessible. But okay, using unitarity of the dynamics, one can also obtain this, this type of uh, estimate also for times which are like twice the Rn first time. So these are the good words. Okay? And these good words, if alpha, alpha is small, these good words, they are already a big jump, big junk, uh, chunk of all the words. Okay? So namely, uh, uh, if you fix some epsilon, you can take alpha small enough such that uh, the number of bad words, that is non-good non words, will be uh, relatively small. Small here means the small power of 1 over h. Okay. So among all this, among the 2 to the n, 2 to the n is also a small power, is some power of 1 over h, but you can, you can adjust. This is just combinatorics, easy combinatorics. <coughs> but make sure that the number of bad words is a small small power of 1 over h. So, of course, this grows when h goes to 0, but it grows slowly. <coughs> and so, these bad words, what can be said? We, can, we cannot apply uh, any uh, semi class. So, for instance, one of these bad words would be the word 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Okay. I'll spend all my time outside of this control region. Then there is no way to try to use propagation of uh, singularities or propagation of, uh, of the Yegorov theorem to try to, to, to control it by, uh, control it by, uh, by this, this control region. Never, it corresponds to points which never enter the control region uh, from time zero to time n. Okay. So that's an example, but there are, there are more, more of those. Okay. And so <coughs> the, the, the trick, I mean, the, the, what, what makes things work is that if you take the time, if you choose a time which is long enough, which is in particular beyond the end first time, okay, then <coughs> uh, each of these words, not just the bad words, but also the good words, all the words are small in some sense, small in terms of operator norm. <coughs> The, norm, the L2 operator norm is, is small in the sense it is given by some power of, of H, by some, some power of some beta, positive beta. Okay? So each of them are small. Okay? And so now there's a little game between, between how small is this uh, H to the beta compared with the number of terms we have. Okay? And so here I'm saying that for any chosen epsilon, I can choose alpha such that the, bad, the number of bad words is uh, smaller than H to many. So now you can play <coughs> with parameters. And if you make sure that uh, this epsilon, if you choose this epsilon to be smaller than beta, then you end up with the fact that you can control the whole thing by first the good parts and the bad parts. And the bad parts, here you just use triangle inequality, saying that uh, <coughs> the norm of this sum is smaller than the sum of the norms. Okay. And the norms, there, all of them, all these guys are bounded by h to the beta. So <coughs> you end up with this parameter. This, this remainder, and, and of course here you have one, here you have something which is smaller than one, you can put it on the, on the left, and you end up with this. Uh, you end up with the control, uh, control estimate you want. <coughs> okay. So the, what remains to prove is uh, to prove this, uh, to prove that, uh, this inequality. Okay. And this, this was the hardcore, hardcore part of the proof in the, in the, in the paper by, by uh, Jean and Dettel. <coughs> the most original part. <coughs> so how did they prove this? They used, <coughs> okay, well, first of all, let me justify one we need to go beyond the RNP time. <coughs> okay. This, this estimate. This estimate cannot be true if we are before the Rn first time. If n is smaller than Rn first time, this cannot hold. Okay, this estimate cannot be true. Why? Because uh, okay, if you conjugate by this unitary uh, unitary evolution operator, unitary propagators at time n over two, you, you can rewrite this operator as a product of two operators. One operator corresponds to a, a product if of future evolutions. And the second is a product of past evolution, okay? And both of them are evolutions up to time n over 2. So if the time here is smaller than r plus time, n over 2 is smaller than half r plus time. And hence, these two operators, they are admissible. One can use, uh, one can use uh, uh, semi-classical methods to understand uh, these operators, this a plus and a minus, okay? 
except that one in the, is in the future, the other is in the past. And so this product, okay, this operator here is just this product of these two operators. And this, because they are admissible, they are given by quantization of uh, admissible symbols. And the product of the two operators is approximately the quantization of the product. <coughs> and now you know that these two, these two guys, they oscillate between 0 and 1. Okay? So the, the L infinity norm of this guy typically is, equal to, is, is approximately equal to 1. And there is one more, one more ingredient in semi-classical analysis, is that uh, the, the norm of, uh, L2 norm of the operator, of the quantization, is approximately given by the L infinity norm, the subnorm of the symbol. Okay. It's called calderon Bayancourt uh, estimate. So <coughs> we know here that for times which are admissible, so beyond the admissible time, when the symbols are admissible, uh, this, this, uh, this operator has a norm equal to 1. Okay. So it cannot have a norm which is bounded by H2 theta. So this explains why we need to go beyond, beyond this yeah. first time, okay, beyond this uh, log, log H over, over lambda. <coughs> All right, <coughs> so the main ingredient, the new ingredient in this proof is the so-called fractal uncertainty principle, okay, which is a, let's say, which I, I will use as a black box uh, result in uh, harmonic analysis, in one-dimensional harmonic analysis. Okay. So, <coughs> I mean, the statement is about, so it's, a, it's an uncertainty principle, so it tells you that if a function is uh, localized or essentially localized in some part of the line, or unit interval, if you want, and if you, can, if, you, if you take the Fourier transform, so here a semi-classical Fourier transform, that is H, H Fourier transform, then the, the, the Fourier transform cannot be simultaneously localized in also a small region. And here a small region is not just in terms of length or volume, okay, a length because this is part of the interval, but it, it also depends on ge ge geometric structure, on the geometric structure of these uh, of this, uh, this subsets. Okay. So the idea, why is it called fractal? Because uh, the statement concerns fractal subsets, okay, fractal subsets of the interval, the unit interval. So if you take two fractal subsets of the unit interval, x and y, you, you thicken these intervals by h, okay, by this semi-classical parameter. Okay. You thicken them, you end up with a, a sum of many intervals, many very small intervals. And you ask yourself, is it possible to squeeze uh, an, a state, a quantum state, it's L2 function, can it be squeezed in Fourier space inside this, uh, this uh, y of h, this thickened set y, so this is represented by this uh, vertical coordinate, okay, this is the Fourier coordinate here, sign. Can we squeeze this state here and simultaneously squeeze the function itself uh, inside, the, inside the, this x of h, this fractal, thickened fractal set x of h. So if this would be possible to squeeze simultaneously the Fourier, the Fourier transform inside y and the, the, the function itself inside x, then the product of these two operators applied to u would be approximately equal to 1. Okay. And the statement is that this is not possible. Namely, the product of these two operators has a norm, an L2 norm, which is uh, small. Okay. When H is 0. So that's, <coughs> okay, so this came up, I mean, this, this result here was, uh, was introduced by, uh, this type of estimate was introduced by Dietloff and Zal. Okay. And they were interested in question of uh, resonances in hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic surfaces, on hyperbolic of infinite, uh, infinite uh, uh, volume, <coughs> infinite area. Uh, so they were interested in, in, uh, in gap, uh, resonance gaps, okay, gaps in the, in the distribution of resonances. <coughs> and then, uh, well, they realized that, uh, I mean, uh, they realized that you could use this also in this, in this set of <coughs> compact, compact, uh, <coughs> compact hyperbolic surfaces. Okay. So, <coughs> okay, when I say fractal, I just mean that uh, the set X of eight and X and Y are porous. Porous means that uh, if you look at, okay, we look at this, at the, 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 at the interval x, x of h, okay? And if you took any interval, any sub-interval i uh, on, the unit, uh, on the unit interval, uh, there will be some sub-interval j, okay? Which is uh, relatively, which is not too small, which is a subset of i, not too small, that is <coughs> bounded by a constant times i, such that this set j does not intersect the, the set i. So it means that you have holes at all scales, you have holes everywhere at all scales, <coughs> Uh, starting from uh, from scale one down to scale zero. So this is, a, this is a, the fractal. The, the, the property of the fractal property is this porosity. Okay. So <coughs> the important thing is that this is not just a volume. I mean, this, this does not just depend on the volume, the length of x and y, because the, this x x of h and y of h could have volumes which are quite large. Okay, which are much larger. 
So of course, if the volume of x and x and y, x of h and y of h were very small, then I mean the, this would be simple. It would be just a start, start, the, it would uh, it end up with the standard standard principle, which tells you that you cannot squeeze a state on a on a scale smaller than square root h uh, in momentum and position at the same time. But this holds this. The principle also holds if the volumes of these guys is uh, much larger than square root h. So, and it really depends on the, on, the, on the fractal property, on the geometric property of this. Uh, so for instance, you cannot replace x of h by some periodic, periodic uh, lattice of, uh, of uh, small intervals. It does not work. You need these this holes at every scale from scale 1 down to scale, uh, to scale 0. <coughs> okay, so how, I mean, what's the connection between this principle and our problem? Well, if you look back at the at the classical uh, classical AW plus, I remember you AW is is uh, the product of this uh, is the product of this uh, of this cutoff functions evolved by the flow. Okay. <coughs> so, and if you suppose uh, taking the product, each of these guys is uh, is uh, let's say is supported on some some set of stripes. Okay. So if you take the product, well, the, then the, the support of the product is the intersection of the supports. Okay, so each color here corresponds to a certain time, <coughs> one of the times, time one, two, three. Okay, and so when you take the product of these guys, <coughs> well, the, the support will be given by the intersection of these uh, different types of stripes, and you end up with these uh, very thin stripes, the very red red stripes here, okay, which are, look like lines, but they are still stripes which are very thin. Okay, so this this is the the, the support of A W plus, and you see that it has, it looks like it has a fractal structure. Because uh, it's, a, it's an intersection of stripes of many, of many different scales, starting from scale 1 to scale uh, 2 to the minus lambda n, or lambda n over 2, okay, because I go up to time n over 2. And so if you, of course, along the stable direction, it, it's very smooth, okay? <laughs> the function of the sport is just uh, some, some, uh, some nice, uh, nice interval, but if you go transversely to this uh, direction, so for instance, if you go in the unstable direction, this unstable direction here, what you observe, when you take the intersection of the support, you observe a set which really has this uh, fractal property. Okay. So x, what I call x w plus, is just the intersection of the, the red stripes with this, uh, this uh, blue interval, okay. and you end up with something which has a, a fractal structure from the size 1 down to the size e to the minus lambda n over 2. So here, <coughs> so this is for time, uh, for time uh, uh, of size uh, t over 2, uh, r test over 2. So you end up with something which, uh, which is <coughs> fractal down to the size square root n, square, square root h. But if you go down to the r test time for w plus, if you go beyond, then this set will be, will be, uh, will be porous from scale, scale 1 to scale, uh, scale h, which is exactly what we had for this. Uh, in this, in this uh, fractal uncertainty principle. Okay, so we see here some fractality coming just from this the construction construction of this uh, of this uh, of this evolved uh, of this uh, um, refined refined uh, classical partition. <coughs> so this is one one set of it, and we had this is a set in the future corresponding to the evolution in the future. And uh, if you do the evolution, look at the evolution of the past, you'll have the same phenomenon, except that the fractality will be transverse to this unstable direction. So this is the unstable direction. Okay, so the support of this a minus uh, w minus, if you want, this other part corresponding to the past evolution, is fractal when you look when you look at transversely to these stable directions. For instance, along the unstable direction, you observe a uh, set which is fractal, also from size uh, one to scale size h. <coughs> so you have these two two directions, okay, in phase space, two sets in phase space, and somehow it starts to look like you have a product. So in what in you are interested in the product of these two operators, okay, the, the operator with the <coughs> evolution in the past in the in the future times the operator with evolution in the in the, in the past, okay, and each of them is associated with a, a set which is fractal in some direction, and the other one is fractal in some other direction. So what remains to be done is to connect this product, which comes from, uh, which is associated with these foliations, this uh, stable versus unstable foliation, to transform it into a product of a characteristic function uh, on, uh, <coughs> on a set and, and its Fourier for transform. So the question is, how can we translate, how can we straighten somehow this, uh, this, this, uh, these two objects? Okay. So this can be done. <coughs> okay, uh, okay, one has to work with it. Pieces. So in, in constant curvature, these foliations are smooth, and because they are smooth, 
one can at least straighten up one of these foliations. So for instance, we can straighten up the stable foliation by a simple, by a single uh, symplectomorphism kappa here. We can transform this stable foliation into a vertical foliation. Okay. But when you do it, you still have a, uh, this, 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 uh, this blue foliation, the stable foliation is not made horizontal. Okay. Straight away, you cannot do it uh, simultaneously. But you can do it after cut, cutting things in small pieces. Okay. You can start in very thin pieces. After into it's called we call it them clusters. Okay, clusters are just a, a partition, a, a thin partition of this uh, of this uh, these bands here, and uh, each cluster can be straightened approximately to a, to a let's say a vertical versus horizontal uh, horizontal pieces. Okay, so at, up to this uh, cluster decomposition, uh, we can we can <coughs> now end up with something which really resembles what we had for this fractal uncertainty principle. Okay, and <coughs> So this is, a classic, this is a classical transformation, classical transformation of phase space, and this can be quantized into uh, let's say quantum yeah. operators, it's called Fourier integral operators, which are a quantum version of this kappa and kappa, kappa index Q. Okay. And when you do this, <coughs> this full operator can be written down as a sum over all these clusters, and all these clusters, for each cluster you end up with something which, uh, which is conjugated by unitary transformations, or subunit rate transformations conjugated to this uh, product of vertical versus horizontal. So you, you apply the fractal uncertainty principle to each of these pieces for each cluster. And then they also you have to argue to, by the fact that these clusters, they are in some sense independent of one another. Okay. Independent means that the norm of the sum of the operator is approximately given by the, the, maximum, uh, the maximum norm of all, these, uh, of each, all the terms. Okay. So it's, it's much better than just using, uh, using uh, Triangular inequality, of course. Okay. So we have to, to argue that these guys, they are, they are orthogonal, essentially orthogonal to each other. Okay. And so, <coughs> just finishing, because I'm late, uh, by the, the slight, the differences one has to make when you are in non-constant curvature. Okay. So there are several problems which have to be tackled. So one problem is the fact that the Lyapunov exponent, which governs this uh, expansion, is not constant. Okay. It has, it is bounded from below and from above. But this ends up with the fact that there are not, there's not a unique Egorov, uh, sorry, a unique Ehrenfestheim. There's a maximum Ehrenfestheim, a minimum Ehrenfestheim, depending on the, the size of the, of the local Yapunov exponent. Okay, so the, somehow this makes some complications. And also one big complication is the fact that the foliation, the stable and unstable foliation, are not smooth anymore. They are only uh, C2 minus epsilon, yeah, at best. And this is really a rigid, a rigid, uh, uh, estimate some sense. You cannot go beyond. If you are C2, then you must be C infinity. And, and then it means that you, you are essentially uh, uh, conjugate to this constant curvature case. So there are only C2 minus epsilon. So I mean, trying to play with this uh, small, relatively small regularity with semi classical analysis and with pseudo differential calculus, uh, that's, uh, that's complicated because, uh, as I said at the beginning, I mean, to play with <coughs> semi classical analysis, you, you are in a you want to be in a high regularity realm, high regularity setup, and here you have a small regularity, in some sense. So one has to, to turn around, turn around <laughs> problem. So somehow technically we cannot use the same methods as the, use, the one used in the paper by, uh, by uh, Jean and, uh, and Yatov. But okay, one has to do it, so we have to adapt a bit the time separation. We don't treat the future and the past in the same way. Okay, for the for the future. We don't evolve too much. We evolve up to time a small, a small fraction of the current time, which means that we can still use semi-classical analysis and microlocal methods uh, for this uh, future time. But in the past direction, we have to do, we have to go to this current uh, time, which makes things more complicated. Okay, so, so somehow there's an asymmetry between the future and the time. But then the rest of the idea is the same. That is, we, we have to, to find appropriate appropriate uh, symplectomorphisms to straighten up to straighten up the locally the local foliation. Okay. Product of foliations, straighten this up, and then use again the, uh, the uh, uh, fractal density principle applied to this, uh, this vertical versus horizontal foliation. Okay. Right. So this is uh, my talk. Sorry for the extension. <laughs>
<coughs> so uh, we want well, okay. So I mean, our operators they cannot they cannot be analyzed by using a Yegorov theorem. But what what we can prove what can, we can prove that uh, each operator a w uh, a minus w minus is micro localized in some some uh, rectangles of size h. And to prove this, some, some out, this is what I was trying to plot here. Yeah. This, uh, you had this, uh, these lines, this uh, dark, dark blue line, which represents the operator, and this, uh, let's say, uh, cyan, uh, cyan uh, rectangles, which have size h, or h to the 1 minus epsilon, or something. And so to prove this, to prove that our operator is localized in, inside these rectangles, we need, we need the evolution to be uh, at least c1 plus something. Okay, we, uh, this is the argument we use, is uh, making use explicitly of this regularity. So this is why, and this is, uh, yes, this is true in two dimensions. Uh, this is one problem one would have in high dimension is the fact that in high dimension, the foliations are not even C1 in general. But here they are C1 plus alpha, and we really need this in order to control this uh, micro-localization. Uh, so somehow we, we can prove that the R operator is uh, expressed in terms of sums, in, into a sums of Lagrangian, Lagrangian uh, states, if you want Lagrangian or WKB states associated with uh, unstable Lagrangians or close to unstable Lagrangians. And we need to control where these unstable Lagrangians are setting, are, are localized inside, inside these uh, H rectangles. So we cannot do that uh, without this assumption of uh, C1 regularity. C1 plus something regularity. Um, so in the constant curvature case, uh, using the quantum classical correspondence, can you say something about the high uh, frequency limit of, uh, the support of high frequency limit of uh, resonance? Uh, resonance state. You mean yeah. uh, local real resonance state? So far, no. But I guess you, one can say something. Yes. I'm doing so. One of the projects uh, is uh, maybe uh, to go along this direction. But uh, maybe, even in you don't need constant curvature. I guess you can say something already. In, uh, also in uh, variable curvature. But, uh, I don't have a clear statement so yet. So, maybe. Okay, so let's thank Stefan again. And